hack into cybersecurity? There's a ton of content out there, and if you don't know where to start, it can be overwhelming, even paralyzing. So let's fix that. Welcome to Simply Cyber, a community of tens of thousands of aspiring and active cybersecurity professionals focused on networking, knowledge sharing, and professional development. I'm Dr. Gerald Dozier, Chief Content Creator at Simply Cyber, inviting you to get the answers to your cybersecurity problems with hundreds of cybersecurity videos answering your frequently asked questions, interviewing industry experts, and live streaming daily cyber threat briefings hosted by me. Now get the stories and insights you won't find anywhere else. Hit subscribe now and dig into all the fresh content on the channel and in the community. Nothing should stop you from launching and leveling up your cybersecurity career today. October 30th, 2023. Welcome to episode number 483 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. I am your host, Dr. Gerald Ozier. And over the next 45 minutes, me, you, Angie Yarbrough, Matthew Necci, Leon Elliott, Jonathan Carpenter, Jenny Housley, Eric Taylor, the mods, Tina T Tina Teeny with the blue badging, Divine Dream, Divine Cherie Slam, carry for a few minutes until he goes, takes his sec plus. Rob Class in Space Tacos, my man Marcus Kyler, and so many more of the Simply Cyber community like Ms. Julian Subro and Justin all are going to be shredding the top cybersecurity news stories of the day. And I'll be giving my expert opinion and analysis on each of those stories on what it means to you as a practitioner. So how can you use this to drive cyber risk reduction at your organization today or next week? Or if you're looking to break into the industry, believe me, you're going to be asked in any job interview, how do you stay current on the cyber industry? This right here is a phenomenal answer. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> so um, you will be asked in any job interview, how do you stay current? So believe me, this is a great answer. Plus, you're going to hear all the terminology. You're going to be up to date on what's going on. And you're going to see that 50 squad memberships just kind of drop from Eric Taylor. Boom, baby, boom. All right, Eric Taylor dropping bombs like it's uh, like it's like it's his job. Way to go, Eric Taylor and barricade. Eric Taylor, another fifty drawn bomb. Oh my! Oh my! The vapors! Woo! Oh my God! All right, so here we go. If you are in chat right now and you are getting gifted sub memberships, be sure to take full advantage of your uh, squad emo tray, starting with the Oprah's obs. So thank you very much, Eric Taylor. Thank you very much, Barricade Cyber Solutions. We love having you. Everybody enjoys being a squad member like Adam Lieb and Lane Hubble, Ariana Martinez, Jay, everything. So great. So wonderful. What a way to start the week. Thank you very much. All right, guys. Uh, oh, so great. Hey, before we dig into the show, uh, I'd love to share the stream sponsors with you. Many of you already know Barricade Cyber Solutions because he just dropped a hundred bomb on everyone's head. But let me tell you a little bit about his business. Let me get this pop-up up so you can see his beautiful uh, situation here. Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. But Barricade Cyber Solutions knows how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. Believe that. Check them out at barricadecyber.com. Links in the description below. Get ready to hear the whoosh sound for the next 20 minutes uh, as as the uh, automate automation just starts play, playing that. There it is. Funky Monk. All right. Hey, guys. Also want to say shout out and holla, holla, holla to Panopsi. I had a meeting with Brandon Poole on Friday last week. Great to hear from Brandon. Panopsi Security can help you get a partner who understands your cyber program and your business goals. More importantly, if you don't really have a cybersecurity program, if you're trying to figure it out, if you're like, should we implement CIS 18 or should we implement NIST CSF? What's the deal with ISO? Is COVID really a thing? Guys, not COVID, COVID. Yes. And Panopsi Security can help you answer all those questions. Think of them as GRC, um, you know, weaponized. Okay. They, they definitely know what they're doing. Uh, give them a call, panopsi.com. Uh, and ask for Brandon Poole. Also want to say shout out and love to Anti-Siphon Training, but more about them at the mid-roll. 
It is Monday, which means it's Callan Art of the Week. We're going to have to audible because uh, my, my little guy uh, did not prepare Art of the Week. Final final soccer game of the season for young Callan. So uh, we had a busy weekend. I'll share with you at jaw jacking some of the additional activities I've done to the buffer, buffer, the buffer overflow, the buffer overflow, uh, Osier flow studio. But stay tuned for that. I want to remind you each episode of the daily cyber threat briefing is worth half a CPE. So say what's up in chat. Hashtag team live. If you are live with us, what's up? Iodeji Johnson. Good to see you. Hey, Hashtag team live in chat if you're live with us right now. Hashtag team replay if you're on replay. Say what's up. Take a screen cap. Save it off. Half a CPE. They stack two and a half a week. Ten a month. I heart GRC also a lot of. Plus I heart that blue badging. Looks good on you. All right. Hey, so check it out. If it is your first time on the show, hashtag first timer in chat. We do love. We do love. Uh, well, I love the first timers. You know, I'm not going to speak for everybody else. But hashtag first timer if it's your first episode. Episode 483. Welcome to the stream. Welcome to the chat. Really, really happy to have you. Also, uh, really quickly, I did pin really quick. I did pin on YouTube. You could see it drop down here in the uh, thing. Um, I did do a course uh, that released last week. It's absolutely free. Basically, XM Cyber paid me to build this course, and then it, they're, they're giving it away for free. So if you want to learn exposure management, um, which is basically like the evolution of vulnerability management from me, go check it out. Like I said, pin comment in chat if it just get more information. Woo! All right, hold on. There we go, Ric Flair. All right, guys, do me a favor. Get your coffee. <laughs> get your coffee. Ooh, Jay Anson, first timer. Jay, my man. Let me tell you this. Welcome to the party, pal. You are in good hands. Hey, oh wow, hold on, that's a tough name. Uh, Yusu, Yusu Vidzim, Yusu Vidzim, Eugene Uver, hashtag first timer. Welcome to the party, pal. Love it. Hey, priceless pancakes, significant win. Finally convinced the C-suite that removable me removable media needs to be off by default, and cloud storage is better. GRC wins again. We just become best friends. Yep. Thanks so much, Priceless Pancake, for the um, super chat, obviously. But also, more importantly, congratulations on moving the needle forward at your organization with some GRC love. I do, do love it, obviously. Oh, James McQuiggan coming in from the top rope. Woo! -hoo! Free courses. Jerry, you are the man. Greetings from St. Louis, Missouri. Team Live Coffee Cup. Cheers. Thank you so much, James and Quiggin. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, coffee cup cheers to all of you. I'm going to take a big slug. Woo! Kayani Nelson gets the woo. woo! Welcome to the party, and pal. welcome to the party, pal. Good on y'all. You guys are in for a treat. Yeah, Jay Anson, Yusuf, Zim, and Kayani, you guys are in for a treat. El Ellery Dora, it's in the pinned comments on YouTube. Uh, just go ahead and look at that, or I can just I can just do this really quickly. There we go, Ellery. It's in chat now. All right, guys, do me a solid. Sit back, relax. Let me take a big old slug off this coffee. Definitely enjoy the crap out of those squad memberships uh, for the hundred people who picked those up. Thank you so much, Eric Taylor. Get your squad emotes on. Get your coffee on. Let me take a slug, and then we're gonna get busy here. Oh my good, so good. Coffee, so good. All right, guys, sit back, relax, and let's let the cool sounds of the hot news wash over us in an awesome wave. I will see all of you at the mid roll. From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. These are the cybersecurity headlines for Monday, October 30th, 2023. I'm Steve Prentice. D.C. Board of Elections breach may include entire voter roll. Whoa, hold on. We got Cat GPT coming in with a super chat. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Shall we play a game? Uh, meow, meow, Cat GPT, right? Coming in strong. Thanks so much for the super chat. This fact was revealed in a statement released Friday by the District of Columbia Board of Elections. The breach was first revealed earlier in October when voter data was discovered being offered for sale at an online forum. 
Further investigation right, reveals the breached. Hold on. Sorry, I'm screwing with the news. Marcus Kyler said, did anyone else sign up and not get the email? So I signed up. It. I think it is automated. I mean, excuse me, Marcus. I think it is not automated. Again, XM Cyber owns the rights to, <clears throat> excuse me, XM Cyber owns the rights to the course. I don't think you can sign up with like a Gmail or something. Obviously, they're using it as a lead generator for uh, the security technology solution that they sell. So uh, it did take me uh, a few hours to get the email. But I know I know that they're not. Well, I shouldn't say I know. I tried to sign up with my Gmail the first time so I could test it out and it didn't work. And then I signed up with my company's account and it did work. So that's what's up with that. Database contained a copy of the full voter roll, and it is unknown whether the PII has been accessed. The board has brought Mandiant in to investigate and describes this as an ongoing and active investigation. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, so DC election. So anyway, like, okay, so a PII of voter related information has been uh, breached and compromised, okay? Could not pinpoint, let's see. Um, a group breached the district's election, oh my God, election authority um, on October 6th, they confirmed it. They hired Mandiant, which by the way, like again, you can hire Barricade Cyber Solutions because Barricade Cyber is awesome, but you will see a lot of times in big, um, Oh my God, we got to figure out a way to turn off the whooshing sound when it's a hundred squad drop because it's just like in my ear, in my ear, in my ear. Um, Mandiant will get hired to come in. Mandiant was acquired by Google last year, but Mandiant is seen as kind of like the big uh, incident response breach firm. Uh, basically, if it's a Fortune 50 company, if it's a US federal government entity, uh, big ticket items, Mandiant will typically get in there uh, right away. Now, what does this mean for us as practitioners? So first of all, it doesn't mean much day to day for our, um, you know, reducing risk for our own organizations. What it could mean is a couple things. One, depending on what it, what happens, I could easily see politicians pointing to this and saying, oh, like, you know, questioning the results of, you know, an election, say, I don't know, next year in the presidential election and being like, oh, as we saw the DC uh, elections got hacked last year. So, you know, these things can be hacked, even though this is a voter registration and not the actual voting machines. I could see that being kind of glazed over. Um, I, I don't think that this is a major issue. Obviously, you don't want this data breach. But at the same time, I think it's in Ohio. Like there's places in Ohio, I believe, where like you can Google the voter. Reg I'm not Google. You can query the voter registration database. Right. So. The, the data that's in here is protected for DC, but in other parts of the country, it's accessible and, and, and queryable. So you know what I'm saying? So anyways, I, I don't think that this is a major issue, but it's not great. Uh, definitely shakes the confidence. Also, hey, I want to remind everybody, and, and I know this isn't really fair for Jay Anson, Kayani, and Yusu Bidzem, or all the hashtag first timers, but on... Friday last week, this is just a, a, a small update. On Friday last week, there was a story about um, government trying to give CISA a 25% budget cut. And we talked about what that is and everything. Somebody reached out to me on LinkedIn, I believe, directly. Um, Be Becky, I believe. Uh, and by the way, I loved this position and this opinion. And uh, Becky said, hey, you know, CISA is responsible for election tampering and election security and assuring confidence of election, you know, uh, integrity. And it's interesting that we're, we're talking about potentially taking 25% of their budget away leading into an election year. I thought that was a really um, heady observation. And then, you know, start to begin to look at which politicians are driving this CISA 25% budget cut, et cetera. Very interesting. Again, this is not a political show. I do, we do tiptoe the line, but we don't go deep. But it's just an interesting uh, dimension to that story that I wanted to share with you all because I found it really, really uh, worth worthwhile. Lockbit claims Boeing breach. 
After adding the aircraft manufacturer, the Boeing company, to its Tor leak site, the gang is claiming it is in possession of, quote, a tremendous amount, end quote, of sensitive data and has set a deadline of November 2nd. There appears to be no sample data as of this recording, a fact that Lockbit itself says in a statement is to, quote, protect the company, end quote. Brett Callow, threat analyst at MSysoft, posted on Twitter slash X, quote, hmm, Lockbit has previously listed companies when it was, in fact, a vendor to the company that was compromised, end quote. Okay, oh, Jesus. All right, so check it out. Boeing is a massive company, okay? Everybody knows Boeing. In fact, hey, shout out to the low country where they're building 787s right down here in the backyard. Boeing's massive. Boeing is a uh, an engineering marvel. Uh, they're awesome. 160,000 employees. It's, I'm going to guess like $40 billion annual revenue. I mean, they, they are a juggernaut. Okay. Now, if Lockbit did steal data from them, it could be anything. It could be employee records. It could be you know, intellectual property. It could be the blueprints and schematics for the 797. Like who knows, right? It could be a lot of different things. Uh, as they pointed out in the story, sometimes they breach a third party. Boeing is definitely using all sorts of vendors and third parties to help them. So it could be, you know, some, some independent architect firm that's doing landscaping for the new Boeing facility, or it could be some type of think tank that they've hired for space travel, right? But at the end of the day, that's not Boeing, right? That's the third party. So until until Lockbit releases some information that would indicate what kind of data they have, it's kind of speculation at this point. We can't even confirm. We can't even confirm, or Boeing probably uh, cannot confirm that they've actually been successfully breached or not. I do want to point out, I, I forget to say this sometimes, I do not prepare or research any of these stories in advance. So you're getting my raw, fresh take on each of these. The final thing I want to point out, okay, this is uh, worth noting. Lockbit, and, and uh, if Eric Taylor's in chat and has thoughts on this, Eric Taylor from Barricade Cyber deals with these, scum, um, with these threat actors all the time. Um, Lockbit is so massive with their affiliate model, and they have so many threat actors being affiliates that I have heard and read that their like their business operations is kind of a dumpster fire like they have so much going in and so many victims and so much data everywhere that they actually kind of are overwhelmed right now and sometimes like a victim will pay a ransom and they they won't get their keys to decrypt their data not because lockbit sucks but because they're just like literally overwhelmed with work which if you're a threat actor i guess that's thumbs up like you're making Straight cash, homie. You make it straight cash, homie. But that's not the point. The point is, what I'm saying is Lockbit. It, dude, say what you will. I agree. I'm not I'm not here to promote or endorse cybercrime. But it's a business. And they run it like a business. And right now, they are in like um, the busy season, if you will. Uh, it's kind of always the busy season. But the, their operational processes are overwhelmed at Lockbit right now just because of the amount of freaking affiliates uh, that they got going on. Striped Fly malware infects 1 million Windows and Linux hosts. According to Kaspersky, this cross-platform malware remained undetected for five years, being wrongly identified as a Monero cryptocurrency miner, and now is being classified as an APT malware, <laughs> with the crypto miner element being revealed as a decoy. The researchers state that they were impressed by its, quote, sophisticated Tor-based traffic concealing mechanisms, automated updating from trusted platforms, worm-like spreading capabilities, and a custom Eternal Blue SMB V1 exploit, end quote. Stanford University. Uh, looking at this, this is a very advanced piece of uh post exploitation well actually it looks like it does exploitation and post exploitation um on linux machines it's on a million systems wow linux and windows machines which is rare you don't you don't typically see malware that is you can write code in uh well obviously in an interpreted program like python or whatever uh, but you can also write it in Java, which is write once, run anywhere, right? So you can you can write code to run in different things. But like, see how it says PowerShell scripts? Like PowerShell is not running on Linux, okay? So this, I don't know if they made two different versions of Stripe Fly and, you know, payloads for each. Um, 
See, it says uses Linux devices on the network using SSH and internal blue. I didn't know you could use eternal blue on Linux. Eternal blue attacks the SMB V1 protocol. Correct me, correct me if I'm wrong. Does 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 Linux support? Hold on. This is gonna be one of those things where you know I guess I get to find out. Yeah, no, no, no. This guy is using Linux to do the attacking. It's, I'm pretty sure you don't, you can't, the SMB isn't on Linux machines, right? Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, Zig is saying that uh, PowerShell does run on Linux. Interesting. I did not know that. Well, there you go, guys. Hey, here's here's a fun fact I want everyone to know. I've worked in this industry for two decades and I, dude, there's a ton. I don't know. You're still, you're always going to be learning new stuff. And I just learned something right there. So thank you very much. Um, yeah. Samba. Th thank you, Leonardo. Yeah, definitely. I, I know about Samba and Nathan Bolin, but you can't, can, you can't use eternal blue to exploit Samba, right? The eternal blue vulnerability is in SMB V1, not Sa Samba, right? A anyways, here's the TLDR. This is an advanced piece of malware that has laid in a million systems for five or six years. It's pretty uncommon to have... Yeah, thank you, BSEC. I'm getting a second opinion here that like Eternal Blue has nothing to do with Linux. So I, I, I don't know what, what they're saying here, but anyways... If you are, here's what I would do. If you're a malware analyst, you may want to rip down Striped Fly from, um, you know, uh, VX Underground or Malware Bazaar or whatever um, and go look at it. It sounds like it's a really interesting piece of um, malware. Also worth noting, uh, you would hope that if you are infected by this, um, you would you would uh, be able to tell what it is now. Actually, you know what we should look like? Striped fly IOCs. Uh, yeah, th this is an interesting one um, simply because like, Okay, so like even right here, you could see here in this story, and, and oh my god, get out of here! Uh, like, an apologies for going a little deep on this one, but you could see here, April 2016, earliest known version incorporating internal blue as indicated by PE timestamps. PE is portable executable. That is the Windows operating system file format that is not going to run on a Linux box. I could take a, a PE file and drop it on any Linux box for days, and it's not going to do anything except crap out when you try to do anything with it. Okay. So all of this makes sense. The weird thing is the Linux piece of it. Like, I don't, I don't get it. Um, I mean, I'm not questioning its ability to be cross platform. Okay. That's definitely, uh, can be done. Okay. Here's what, here's what I like here. I'm going to drop a link. If you're looking for an exercise um, or you just got a, a, a little bit of extra time today in your environment and you have access to like sims and logs and stuff, go and look up these indicators of compromise, right? They might be old, but you can find out whether or not you got these things in your environment. It sounds like it lays dormant and mines Monero. Well, there we go. Um, shout out to BSEC who found this. A uh, little thing. Linux version of Eternal Blue found in Samba. So there we go. We're all winning. Thank you. Investigating cyber attack. The Akira ransomware gang on Friday claimed responsibility for an attack that allegedly stole 430 gigabytes of data. The attack seems limited to the university's Department of Public Safety. And a spokesperson for the university stated that the investigation is still underway. Uh, okay. Stanford. Great, great uh, university. A lot of respect for people graduating Stanford. Obviously, the business school is up in there. Um, I'm not a huge college football fan, but if you are a college football fan, I'm pretty sure Stanford's pretty legit, right? Didn't Andrew Luck go there a million years ago? I don't know. <laughs> uh, we're continuing uh, to investigate this. What got pat? What got hit? That's 
There's no indication the incident affected any part of the university. So, Stan so when it says Stanford University hit, only one system at Stanford University got hit, the SUDPS, which stands for Stanford University Department of Public Safety, which is not a good one to get hit. <coughs> but um, it didn't impact police operations or emergency services. So Stanford itself as a university is fine. Um, this is kind of a, to me, this is, I don't know about you guys, but when I see something like this, to me, that like, it's not good, obviously, but this is like a flare up, right? Like, this is like, oh, I got a little bit of a rash and it's flaring up. I just put some ointment on it and I'm good to go. Like, like on to the next thing. Like, I'm not really, I, I'm not even holding a public presser about this thing. Maybe uh, I would send a communication to students and, and maybe parents, but not really. Like I would send a message to students and donors, obviously alumni and donors, uh, that there was an issue, um, and you know it like no information was compromised. All emergency services are operating at normal um, capabilities. Thank you very much. I'd almost I, like this sounds terrible, but this is a reality. I would almost write the email in such a dry way because I don't really think that there's any like material impact that needs to be concerned with. I would write the email in such a dry way that people would just like be like, oh, okay, like whatever this is, is fine. b -Sex saying that kids were hacking in to remove their parking tickets. Definitely a possibility. <laughs> I can tell you from myself at the University of Massachusetts, many a parking ticket was paid uh, by, by me because, you know, because I, I had a crappy parking pass. So like I would have to park and then take like, you know, like, like a, a bus, like 20 minutes to get to my dorm. Oh, those days, man. Gross. I had a bicycle. Someone stole it. Ugh. All right, let's keep going. And now a word from our sponsor, Hunters. Hunters is a SIM alternative built for your security team. Hunters empowers companies to replace their SIM with unlimited ingestion and normalization of security data at a predictable cost. Using Hunters, a CISO at a leading online retailer, quote, tripled the amount of data ingested by her security team while cutting costs from a legacy SIM provider by 75%, end quote. To learn more about the benefits of replacing your legacy SIM with Hunters, visit hunters.security today. All right, we're at the mid-roll right at 828. Sorry, Nick Barker, two minutes early. Arr. Hey, listen, Angie Yarbrough, want to say what's up? Angie's asking if anyone here is from the cyber boot camp Vanderbilt. If we have a cyber boot camp Vanderbilt contingent in here, hello to you. It's very nice for you to be here and uh, super pumped. And if it's just Angie, hi, Angie. It's great to have you uh, here in chat. Guys, hey, for all our first timers, right? Our John, our Jay Ansons, our Kayani Nelsons, our Yusu Vidzem, we do this every day at the mid roll. All right. Hey, what's up, everybody? Hey, 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 hey. Don't you forget about me. But I want to say what's up and thank you to the stream sponsors, starting with Barricade Cyber, Panopsi Security, and Anti-Siphon Training. Guys, if you don't know about Anti-Siphon Training, let me bring you into the fold. Anti-SiphonTraining.com. They are the training arm under Black Hills Information Security, under John Strand. There is an emote in the tray for all the new squad members. Don't sleep on this... Uh, squad uh emo right there that's let me have some john strands in chat if y'all don't mind please we can we can blow out the john strand emotes anti-siphon training is disrupting the traditional cybersecurity training industry in an epic way by providing high quality cutting edge education to everyone regardless of financial position they offer students the opportunity to learn skills from seasoned practitioners in hands-on labs and they straight crush it Anti-siphon training, sucking at capitalism, and being awesome. Check them out. Links in the description below. Go to the training, pay what you can training. And if you want, you can take all these courses for $0. Thank you, John Strand and the Anti-Siphon Group. Guys, if you want, tomorrow on Halloween at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, you can get started in packet decoding. Also at noon, if you want, you can get professionally evil with testing APIs. Bro. There is no stopping you. Now it becomes a question of, do you have the commitment? Do you have the time? Do you have 
the vigilance to stick through it and finish the training. Because guess what? It's not about um, price anymore. Anti-siphon training, thank you all so very much. Also, really fun fact, we have the uh, 500th episode coming up soon. I'll be talking to TCM Security, getting a bunch of free giveaways. I'll be talking to Try Hack Me, getting a bunch of free giveaways. I'll be talking to Anti-Siphon Training, getting a bunch of free giveaways. I'll be talking to ACI Learning, getting a bunch of free giveaways. We are going to blow the top off. We're going to blow the top off of the 500th episode. Stay tuned for that. All right, guys. Hey, I want to remind all of you. Do me a favor. If you're getting value from the show, really quick, hit the like button. It goes a long way to help others find it. Guys, the Simply Cyber Community Challenge, this guy right here, it's an initiative we've been doing for a couple hundred days. It's super epic. If you would like to supercharge your LinkedIn feed, if you want to build a meaningful network of LinkedIn uh, <clears throat> connections, do the following. Rick Armstrong is going to tag somebody in chat. Go, here's what you need to do. This is the action. Go on LinkedIn, search for this hashtag, Simply Cyber Community Challenge. I know it's hard to see because the screen's kind of cutting it off, but it's the full word, Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Okay, you search for it, you're good to go. Next thing, connect with the people posting, comment on their posts, connect with the people in the comments. Connect with the people posting, comment on their post, connect with the people in comments. It takes less than five minutes a day do you have five minutes a day to build a super valuable network on LinkedIn? The answer is likely yes. Find their posts, comment, comment on them and connect with them. Connect with the people in the comments. You will be a person in the comments, right? So everybody else coming in right after you is going to connect with you. In a couple weeks time, you're going to have a supercharged, awesome network on LinkedIn. Believe me, giddy up on that. Rick Armstrong, please tag somebody. All right. Hey, I want to say shout out and holla, holla, holla to Callan, my son, my youngest son, who does art of the week every Monday. Now, Callan, I think he might be officially taking a sabbatical. I'm not sure. But in his stead, I would like to say shout out to 8-Bit ASCII art screensavers on YouTube, which is what I'm rocking in the background right now. Let's take a look. Nice. I know it's a little fuzzy because I have one of those camera lenses that blurs out the background, but... I love having the TV there, and I love retro synthwave vibes, so that's what's up. All right, guys. Let's uh, let's move on in and finish strong. F5 warns of big IP vulnerability. This critical security vulnerability is being tracked as CVE 2023-46747 with a CVSS score of 9.8 and could result in unauthenticated remote code execution. Discovered by researchers at Praetorian on October the 4th, the vulnerability resides in the configuration utility components. According to a statement from F5, it has released a shell script for versions 14.1.0 and later, but it points out, quote, the script must not be used on any big IP version prior to 14.1.0 because it will prevent the configuration utility from starting, end quote. A link to the statement is available in the show notes to this episode. Ah, <laughs> all right, guys. Here's the deal. All right, a couple things to point out. One, if you're running F5. So in my world, I don't know about you guys. I mean, I've heard of big IP, never been in an environment that... Um, oh, hey, Raymond Napoli. The Midnight is pretty good. Pretty good? Bro. Woo! The Midnight's the best. I love the Midnight. Okay, so guys, check it out. F5 to me is a mid-tier networking... Um, device manufacturer um it's not residential you're not going to find it at your aunt dorothea's house but you might find it in a shop that's not capable of uh buying cisco or whatever or aruba or palo alto okay so here's the deal if you're running f5 big ip you absolutely should listen if you just want to work in infosec if you hear the term Unauthenticated remote code execution. This phrase right here, unauthenticated remote code execution. Immediately, that's a 9.8. Immediately, okay? 9.8 uh, CVSS score, and it'll be a 10 the second it's actively being exploited in the wild, okay? Re unauthenticated remote code execution is the worst. It means anyone, anywhere can punch you in the mouth, okay? This is a phrase 
that you should rem- you should uh, you either will remember it or you know you you <laughs> you know it and you wake up in cold sweats because of it okay now check it out it is a critical security vulnerability obviously there is a patch for it so ah you got to patch it right obviously um this is because it is a um, like firewall type device, it's going to be internet facing. So your risk of remote code, unauthenticated remote code execution is high. And it sounds kind of not trivial, but like the threat actors can just run your config tool and basically uh, put on your pants and wear you, right? Wear you around. Uh, not good. Uh, found by a security research or two security researchers, congratulations from Praetorian. For some reason, Praetorian sounds familiar. Um, what was, was the original, this is, hold on. This is like going way back to, uh, before I had gray hair. So, uh, stay with me. Uh, if you're, if you're one of the olds, <laughs> if you're one of the olds, help me out. Um, before it was called Cali, it was called like, uh, back draft or back, uh, back something. And then before that, there was like a kind of like Roman looking vibe thing to it. And I think it was called Praetorian. I might be mistaken. Um, Backtrack, it was called before. Backtrack. And then before that, I really got to say, I really got to say, hold on. Before Backtrack, what was Cali install called? I remember it. I remember it. Um, you guys remember, like, I remember the, like the, the, it was like red and gold and it was, it was definitely like, like Roman esque in, in nature. Yeah. It was called backtrack, but before that it was called something else. Anyways, whatever. I remember I had the CD. I had the CD. I got it in a book. All right. Also really quickly, just to give you perspective on exposure, shout out to BSEC. Hold on. I got to log in here. Um, how about I don't do this on, how about I don't do this on, on, uh, <laughs> on uh stream. Let's do this. Do, 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 do. Let's see this. No, this is going to be worth like, cause this is actually a practical way to like, va- to validate this really quick. Come on, man. Marcus Kyler, anytime something like this is reported, isn't immediately going to be exploited by someone reading the report. So good question, Marcus Kyler. Not necessarily because just because it can be exploited um, doesn't mean it's it's like trivial, right? Like you might have to have some type of like code or some type of Python. Um, oh yeah, Nopix. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Nopix was before that. I'm thinking of something else too. Uh, really quickly, uh, I want to say shout out to BSEC. So uh, BSEC used the following command on Shodan. You can see it at the top, F5 product colon quote, big IP. Okay. So 381 of these particular vulnerable instances is online right now. So, um, you know, obviously shout out to these people. This is not uh, a major issue. uh, But if you are one of these 381 people, obviously you want to get in front of, get in front of this, like lily.com. Like, what is that? Lily.com. Let's check it out. So Lily Insulin, okay, well, this isn't good. Okay, so Lily Insulin is running this vulnerable thing. It wouldn't be outrageous to see a news story (laughs) next week where Lily is uh, ransomware attacked, okay? So they definitely need to get in front of this. The final thing I'll say about this is this is how you can, uh, A, check if your own organization is vulnerable without necessarily contacting the networking team or the IT team because, you know, like this is indisputable evidence. Second of all, um, you like just from personal experience, you might look at this and say, oh, I'll contact Lily and let them know. Your mileage will vary. I have contacted vulnerable, um, like small businesses that were vulnerable to things uh, or like had like admin creds out and stuff like that on the internet. And I've never gotten a contact back. I've never gotten recognition. I don't want recognition. I've never been like acknowledged by the vict or by the, the the vulnerable party and if anything um i feel like you know like i was exposing myself as potentially like ooh like you're a person of interest cuz we got hit uh yeah so anyways oh yeah eli lily 
Um, so there you go. Eli Lilly is a massive, uh, uh, you know, company with lots of money. Flaming Donkey, please do not put your sights on. Do not put your sights on them, Flaming Donkey. All right, let's keep going. LinkedIn tests generative AI in tech support role. According to the Wall Street Journal, Microsoft-owned LinkedIn is, quote, testing how generative artificial intelligence could help employees and external suppliers get answers about cybersecurity policies within seconds, potentially cutting wait times for business deals or decisions to implement new tools, end quote. The product had been in testing for about four months, both internally and as per LinkedIn CISO and CISO series co-host Jeff Belknap, a parallel product had been developed for suppliers. Another spokesperson for the company described response times as, quote, about five seconds or less, which compares with about 15 minutes when a human helper responded, end quote. Early tests show the chatbots to be around 90% accurate. <laughs> okay. Chatbots, 90% accurate. Now, normally I would be cynical and say, okay, so then the other 10%, we're just going to write off. So they tell you that something's there when it's not. And then you make decisions based on that fake information. And now you're screwed. However, as I think about it being real, um, humans say stuff that is not accurate. So humans are probably less than 90% accurate when they respond. Now it says generative AI. Um, generative AI to field cyber questions. So I wonder if it's like, it says from employees and suppliers. When I saw this story, what I was thinking, and again, I don't research these stories in advance, is third parties uh, questionnaires, which are brutal, guys. If you've worked in GRC for a minute, you you know, like Alana, you probably have PTSD from uh, security questionnaires, right? Like they, sometimes they come in, it's like five questions. Sometimes they come in, it's like 50 pages of questions. And honestly, in my in my world, guys, like I've done... I've done it for years, right? I've seen the big ones. I've seen the low, little ones. I've asked for questions. I've sent big questionnaires out. I've sent small questionnaires out. The reality is, um, it, it, again, the, hold on. Let me, this is a, a, this is a tinfoil hat, speculative hot take. This is my thoughts and my thoughts only. I'm going to do the hacker man a little bit. Here's the deal. Like I could send you 50 questions. Oh, are you using modems? Oh, like, do you have multi-factor on your networking devices? All these things. But really guys, at the end of the day, there's really just a few questions that are going to be deal breakers. Do you have multi-factor authentication on your accounts? Yes or no, right? Do you have incident response capabilities? Yes or no? Like whether or not you have like a modem or something like, yeah, that sucks, but no deal, okay? Great cash, homie. No business deal is going to implode. No merger and acquisition is going to, they're not going to, oh, whoa, the GRC people said you have modems. This deal's over. We're going on to the next one. No, 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 no. That, that's not happening. So to me, I've always been kind of put off by the big questionnaires because it. I guess it makes me and GRC people feel like we're doing our job because we collect all this information, but the information is not actionable. Nobody does anything with it. So what you're really doing is wasting an ass load of time filling these questionnaires, slowing the deal down. Again, I'm not saying that there isn't value in understanding the security posture of the partner organization or whatever, especially with third-party breaches happening all over the place potentially the Boeing one earlier today. But my point is, we should be more deliberate with what we're asking, why we're asking, and what is the impact based on the answers. I don't want to say it's completely prescriptive, but it should be, hey, if they don't have this in place, we can't do it. If they don't have this in place, they need this, this, and this, or else we can't do it, right? We need to be very clear about what we're doing. Instead of being like, subjective and you like, Oh, like wild West. Like, Oh, don't worry. Like it's Boeing. Like, even though they're missing it, they're missing all their stuff. It's Boeing. So it's cool. Oh, this company is, we never heard of before. And they're missing the same stuff as Boeing because we never heard of them. Boo. You're not allowed. Like, what are we doing here? What are we doing? Okay. Now to, to my point, if they're having AI fill out these questions, that's really cool. That's a win for GRC people. 
And frankly, it could reduce the overload and impact to practitioners trying to fill out these questionnaires because realistically, you can paint a picture. You could feed your SSP, if you have one, into uh, AI as like inputs and then have it um, come up with responses based on what you tell it at your security posture is and go forward. Um, so I think there is value in there, a lot of value, frankly. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see. It's definitely not going to replace someone. By the way, the final thing I'm going to point out really quickly, the final thing I'm going to point out, uh, because I think it's wildly important, very, very, very uh, underreported, and I think it's wicked true. Remember this, people, okay? My GRC people. When we ask somebody, do you use multi-factor authentication? Multi-factor authentication is an unbelievably valuable control. It is not bulletproof. Okay, it's not silver bullet. It's not the end all be all. It can be circumvented, but it's a really good control. Okay. When you ask a potential partner or third party or whoever if they use multi factor authentication, they say, yes, of course we do. We use Microsoft Authenticator, we use Okta, Duo, whatever. They probably do use it, but where do they use it? I believe me. They are not using it everywhere. They are not using it for privileged access accounts logging into networking devices like their F5 big IP. Or maybe they are. I don't know. They're not using it. Are they using it to log into lab machines? Are they using it to log into um, like their EDR management console, which is not federated authentication? Okay. Are they using it to log into all their cloud systems that have sensitive information? Yes or no? The thing is, do you use multi-factor? 99% of people think, oh, it's, do our end users use it to log into Office 365? Yeah, but there is an entire swath of access that is outside that scope that is very sensitive and privileged. And a lot of times that, that MFA is not in there. So it's just something to point out. Um, it's just something to point out. Also, I agree, BSEC saying in chat, um, instead of filling out questionnaires, you just send them your uh, policies and stuff like that and tell them to figure it out. Although I will say, if you're dealing with a larger company that has like a uh, web app that inputs or takes in your questionnaire, you can't do that and they'll just, they'll just be bad. <sighs> yes, Alana, exactly. How is it implemented? What about privileged accounts? You should not be like, Yes or no questions. <laughs> like if you actually care about the security of whoever this person is you're evaluating, yes or no questions isn't going to uh, do it. Over $1 million in prizes and 50 zero days at Pwn to Own Toronto 2023. Team Vitel, V-I-E-T-T-E-L, took home the top honors after executing, quote, a heap-based buffer overflow and a stack-based buffer overflow against the TP-Link Omada Gigabit Router and the Canon Image Class MF753 CDW for the Soho Smash-Up. The team earned $50,000 and 10 Master of Pwn points. Other winners from this year's event included researchers from Clarity, C-L-A-R-O-T-Y, and the Stelian Group, S-T-E-A-L-I-E-N, with notable targets being the WiseCam version 3 and the Lexmark CX331 ADWE touchscreen printer. And now... All right, Pwn to Own, baby. Here's the deal. Pwn to Own, in my opinion, is the most prestigious hacking contest in the world, okay? Hey, if an... Ifanyi, Ifanyi Apara, Ifanyi Apara. Welcome to the party, pal. Welcome to the party, pal. Listen, Pwn to Own, if you don't know about it, it happens in Toronto every year uh, or Canada. I think it was in Vancouver one year, but it happens every year. Um, and it is like, in my opinion, like the best, the elite. Um, they could say bug hunter, but in reality, they're security researchers. They're hacking things that are hard. A lot of like, like it's been, it's been, uh, in the past, um, like Apple releases a brand new iPhone and it goes to Pwn to own and they crack it like there. Um, same with some Android devices. It's, it's just the elite to me. It's like the Olympics of, of like hardware hacking or, or system hacking. Right. I love it. Um, 
now it's it's worth it's worth looking into. Obviously, they get a little bit of lead time. It's not like they show up and then like the device is presented to them. It's usually done in teams. Um, real money, guys. A million dollars. Great cash, homie. A million dollars came out of it. Fifty-eight zero-day exploits. Not just fifty-eight. Here's the thing, too. Not just fifty-eight vulnerabilities like zero-day vulns. Fifty-eight exploits, which means they found a zero-day, then made a. Um, they wrote you know, either shell code or some type of exploit to run and fully exploit that vulnerability. Um, I love it. Um, this is a great win for industry because they get essentially free, not free because it's a million dollars, but they get security research. Zero days come out. Um, they're able to patch their stuff. Um, they mentioned in here like wise um, cameras, which I have one of those floating around somewhere. I don't know where it is right now, but wise little camera, Omada gigabit router, TP link, um, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. So it's awesome. If you are ever, um, to me, if you were to compete in Pwn to Own and get something like a zero day or recognition, this is like at the top of my resume. Like I might even just change my name to Pwn to Own Champion. Osier, you know, you know, like uh, clearly, I'm not going to be, but it's just if if you know, you know, this is super legit, and definitely if you're into security research, if you're into software exploitation, if you're into like assembly code and getting into Ida or Ghidra and tearing binaries apart and looking for vulnerabilities, whether it's buffer overflow or um, heap overflow or you know, uh, use after free or double fetch or ROP or JOP or whatever you want to get into. This is your world right here. Love it. Love it. Love it. Congratulations to the uh, winning teams and uh, great cash, homie. Way to get that money, baby. Catch me outside. Catch me outside. How about that? Last week in ransomware. According to Bleeping Computer, both NCC Group and Checkpoint Software are reporting increases in ransomware attacks this year, with a record 514 attacks in September alone. Also last week, Microsoft described Scattered Spider as, quote, among the most dangerous financial criminal groups, end quote. American Family Insurance confirmed that their outage was caused by a cyber attack. Five hospitals in Ontario, Canada were hit with a ransomware attack, and the watchmaker Seiko confirmed that a ransomware attack exposed some customer data. We've got a relief. All right. So NCC. So basically, every Monday, uh, CISO Series does like a ransomware roundup. Again, if you've ever been to a flea market or a yard sale, that's what this is. There's a table full of ransomware incidents all over the place. Everybody look around, look at the table. Find something that works for you, whether it's your industry, whether it's your um, um, your region of the country, whether it's just interesting and you can talk about it. Go ahead and take a look. Uh, the wares are here. You can haggle with the shopkeeper all you want. Uh, we saw 514 attacks in September. That's a gross amount. I'm telling you guys, ransomware is everywhere. You definitely want to have not just protective controls in place. But tabletop exercises, please tabletop exercises to work through what it's going to look like. The final thing I'll say about this, I read this uh, over the weekend, Scattered Spider, okay? Scattered Spider is the group that did the MGM Resorts hack. They are, I, I believe they are younger, so 18 to 25 years old. Uh, they're very... Uh, they're into like social engineering and attacking help desks and phishing and stuff like that, kind of common stuff. Um, and they're 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 braggadocious. Now, here's one interesting thing that I wanted to share with you about Scattered Spider that I've never seen a different threat actor do. And I, I get it; it's kind of effective. So here's one thing that you should make your um, your end users aware of. And I don't know, honestly, I don't know. Uh, the best way to combat this yet. I'd have to really think about it, okay? Scattered Spider is physically threatening victims. Now, here, how's that work? So they'll call like help desk, okay? And they'll be like, hi, I'm, I'm Nick Barker. Change my password. And they're like, yeah, we just need you to like prove who you are. And like, they'll basically figure out who they're talking to on the phone, right? So they're like, oh, hey... Like, oh, hi, thank you for calling. Like, this is Kimberly. What can I do for you? Hey, Kimberly, 
uh, my, this is Nick Barker. I want to reset my password. Yeah, sure. No problem, Nick. Like, what's your middle name? Well, I don't know that, Kimberly. Well, I'm not going to reset your password. No problem. So, like, they'll figure out who Kimberly is. And then using open source intelligence techniques, they'll get some information, whether it's Kimberly's address or Kimberly's, you know, date of birth or whatever. And they'll say, all right, Kimberly, you're going to reset Nick Barker user account, or I'm going to come to 123 Main Street and I'm going to beat the hell out of you, right? Like, or, or they'll say, I'm going to come to your house at this address, or I'm going to find your car, which is a, you know, 1979 Dodge Dart or, you know, red with license plate, whatever, like whatever they can find out about you using OSINT and they will threaten you. Now they don't want your account. They don't want your reset creds. They just want you to do something for them. And some of the victims are knowingly basically succumbing to the threat and, you know, resetting it because, you know, they, they don't want to get physically attacked or whatever. So it's an interesting technique. It's obviously, um, it's obviously, um, you know, despicable, but, and I don't think that there's any truth to the, the, the physical threat because obviously they'd have to, you know, is it is is it worth their time, energy, and effort to fly where you are and beat you up? No, they'll just they'll just they'll just threaten someone else. But um, that's what's up. Yeah, something Wong. Yes, this is streaming on YouTube as well. Uh, so QDEP said, "Isn't this what happened to MGM?" So they did call uh, MGM's help desk and get reset passwords and MFA reset. I do not know if they threatened the help desk person. I'm just. I'm just saying, according to reports that I'm reading, that is part of their playbook. That's part of their TTPs. So just be interested. I'm not be interesting. Just be mindful. You may want to uh, inform your leadership and maybe uh, help desk supervisor that these these attack vectors are happening and think through what to do. So maybe someone threatens you uh, physically. You know what's what what's the what's the SOP? Do you put them on hold and get a supervisor? Do you call the police? Do you just terminate the phone call? Like, what do you do? I don't know. But just be mindful, okay? All right, let's keep going. Fun Super Cyber Friday. All right, guess what, guys? That's going to do it for today's show. If you were here just for the news, we're at 858. Uh, Nick Barker, almost. All right, guys, hey, before we uh, boogie out of here and, and pivot over to jawjacking, let me just do a quick minute and, and uh, talk to you guys. Huntress, um, Huntress is doing a CTF right now. There is a Simply Cyber team. This is a completely free capture the flag. Uh, if you are in chat right now, what I would like to say is uh, Jenny Housley has a specific problem that she's hoping people can help her with. Uh, Jenny Housley has been working on analyzing a wave file and she's tried everything that she knows what to do to analyze this wave file and she's having some uh challenges so if you have some free time if you want to participate in the ctf which is free and you want to help one jenny housley out with uh some analysis a uh, great opportunity to network great opportunity to have a little bit of fun please connect with at jenny housley in chat hey at jenny housley wave file analysis okay give that a shot Guys, as I mentioned earlier in the stream, I did release a cybersecurity exposure management course, or XM Cyber did, um, in relation to work I did. It's five lectures. Uh, it's it's five modules. There's, I don't know, like 20. There's 34 lectures, I think, total. You can knock this out in about four hours. I think it's really cool. If you want to know what the evolution of vulnerability management is and how you can implement it at your organization, that's what's up with this. If you have taken this course and you have thoughts on it, let me know, and I'd love to hear what you uh, what your thoughts are on it. Also, reminder that Simply CyberCon is coming up next week, uh, a week from Wednesday. We are locked and loaded. We've got our speakers. We've done our wet runs. This this conference is going to be lit, y'all. So definitely come come uh, go to simplycybercon.org, register. It's free. It's free to register. Dude, we're all about good times. We're all about community. We're all about support. Come out and support all the speakers. SimplyCyberCon.org has all the information on who's speaking, what they're speaking about. Look at all these wonderful speakers. Ivan, Devin, Tyler, Sandor, 
James, Peter, Chuck Sapp, Aaron Strong, Ms. Kimberly McKnight, Old Cat GPT. Shall we play a game? Guys, it's gonna be oh, and not not to like not for nothing, but keynoted by John Strand. Oh my gosh, okay. No, wait, wait, that's the wrong one. Yes. All right, come on out. All right, so that's going to do it for today's news. If you were here just for the news, thank you very much. We'll be back tomorrow at 8 a.m. Eastern time. For you first-timers, I hope you had a good time. I hope you had a good time, and I hope you come back tomorrow. We'd love to have you. We're all about community here and building a community. For the 326 of you beautiful people, if you'd like to do some jaw jacking, let's do that. I'll see you in a hot minute. Woo, 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 woo. Is this the jaw jacking? Yeah. Uh, let's see. I think their kids' albums probably the right vibes right now. Uh, let me see really quickly. I'm super pumped. Everybody, have, do a little jaw jacking. It's been a minute. All right. Cool. Cool. Here's the kids' album. All right. Brian W. on LinkedIn has the baton. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, Jenny. Brian, if you can, go ahead and post your uh, cyber story on LinkedIn. Use the hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. We'd love to see that. Guys, this is called jaw jacking. We spend, I don't know, about half an hour. Let me make sure I don't have any meetings. I think I have a meeting at 930 with the very talented Kimberly. Let me see. Uh, yep. I can do some jaw jack until 930, y'all, if you want to hang out. Uh, while the jaw jacking comments are getting pulled up here, um, I want to share something with you. Uh, I attend... Oh, James McQuiggan, love in the background. Can't wait to see it at B-Sides. Charleston, speaking of Simply Cybercon, make sure to check out track two. The MC is wicked cool. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Yes, James McQuiggan. Hey, James McQuiggan, we've got to connect. Uh, we went through the wet run yesterday. We have protocols um because i am an insane control freak um we developed protocols on how the how the mc and should be done, how the mc and should be done as far as like layout it, um moving guests in moving guests out etc uh just connect with me and i will get you uh what you need and thanks for the kind words about the studio guys really quick i i attended uh tim fowler's uh space um intro to cyber in space um anti-siphon uh, talk last week or Black Hills talk. Some of you were there. I think Cyber Munchkin was there. He recommended this book. I bought it. I'm reading it. I'm like uh, page 40. Uh, this book's excellent, guys. If you really want to know, um, it's not really, it, yet. Yeah, it's not really about cybersecurity in space. The first half of the book that I've read so far is more just laying out like what, what it's really like to engineer for space. It's quite fascinating. It's very interesting. There are so many constraints um, that, and 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 like it's almost like you're building, like um, it's almost like you're building some type of, you know, NPC character or not NPC, like like a, a, a an Elder Scrolls or a Skyrim character. And like, yeah, you can have like high agility, but then your dexterity is low, or like you can have high strength, but your intelligence is low, like. You want to have shielding from radiation? No problem. That's wicked heavy. So you're going to have to spend a lot of energy on lifting the craft. Okay, you want a little cube set with no propulsion? Okay, so if something's flying at it and it's going to collide, what do you do? Well, you could introduce like some type of torque or flywheel into it to move it a little bit. Okay, well, that's weight. How are you going to deal with that? What about extremes of cold? Like, it's, 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 if you're a nerd, this is like a wicked good primer. So I just wanted to share that with everybody. All right, let's talk. Uh, over the weekend, I received my Simply Cyber shirt, Simply CyberCon shirt. You were right. They are huge. Thanks, Frank. Definitely appreciate it. I saw Adam drop a comment a little while ago. He said he was going to wait for uh, jaw jacking. Uh, Adam says, I was resetting the password on a company website. My password manager uses random password using digits and lowercase and symbols. Yeah. Dude, password managers is where it's at. Uh, Raniel Isaac. Yeah. Uh, as far as registering for the, the course, I'm not sure. Like, again, I built the course, but it was fully commissioned by XM cyber. So I can't, I'm not, I can't, I'm not doing like account management support, troubleshooting those type of things. I made the content, they own it. 
uh, you'll have to connect with them on for like, sorry, Raniel, I wish I had a better uh, way to help you with that, but all right. Wow. New office looks great. Thanks. NSA. Uh, look at the swanky setup guys. Hey, over the weekend, I actually built. So the studio sits up like probably 20 inches off the ground. So stepping into the studio is kind of problematic. So I built, I, some of you may or may not know this a little early tidbits Tuesday. When I first graduated college, I did not, I couldn't find a job. It was like the tech bubble had just burst. Um, they were outsourcing uh, software development jobs overseas. It was a mess. And I had to get a job carrying bricks for a mason, right? Or making cement. Eight hours a day, I was basically working out uh, like a boss. Now, in, in fairness, I was shredded, right? Like this frame does not get shredded. <laughs> but I was I worked like, I don't know, three or four months as a mason tender. And it was hard, hard work. I was going to bed at like 6.30 at night just from pure exhaustion. Anyways... Because of that experience, um, I was able, I built like a stone step thing out, outside to step in. I think it looks pretty cool. Uh, there'll be an entire video of my studio set up once I get it the way I need it to be. But uh, thank you for all the wishes, well wishes for it. And James McQuiggan will be my first in-studio guest sitting in that chair um, next week. All right. Casey is at an MSP. One of our customers let a fake financial manager remote connect to his workstation while he went to lunch. Oh, what's the most effective way to take down this bad link site? Uh, well, I mean, one, I would obviously sever the connection. The thing is, Casey, you can't, you can't um, take down, a, like if they're using like any desktop or team view or something like that, or log me in, like, it's like saying blocking like Office 365 or OneDrive or Google Drive. Like you can't block these SaaS providers that threat actors are using like legitimate services for um, nefarious operations, right? You can't block it. So, you know, this, this gets into like good end user awareness training. Um, obviously, you want to terminate that connection. Um, God dang. That sucks though. You can't really you can't really block it though. Uh let's see. Nick Barker loves furniture. Thank you. Uh Adam V, any advice? So Adam V, what do you want advice on? Uh the only thing I saw. Adam, try to keep it as transparent as possible. I'm looking back. Um Johnny five got the, uh, cyber exposure management course. And then a bunch of football games. I'm actually kind of happy too. The Patriots showed up, but they lost. Um, I'm ready for a complete reboot of the Patriots, uh, including like see you later, uh, Mac Jones. All right. We're, Adam V. I'm not sure. All right. This ended up using some kind of SQL injection reported to the company. Oh, hold on one second, Adam. So Adam saying he was resetting this password. He ended up using some kind of SQL injection attack, reported the company last week and not heard back. Mind you, the company recently had an incident. Any advice? Not in trouble. No, 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 no. You're not in trouble, Adam. I Okay, so I think Adam made a complicated password and they didn't do input validation on the password field and somehow he did some type of quasi-SQL injection attack. Um, with all due respect, Adam, I, I think... Maybe you triggered some type of SQL injection error or SQL error or something like that. But the the likelihood that you had a valid SQL injection query randomly generated by a password vault is unlikely. So you may have caused some type of database error or web application error. But the likelihood that you deleted or dropped tables or updated like SQL the SQL language is very specific on certain keywords in the order of them. So I, I would find it very unlikely that you would randomly generate a, a correct working SQL injection statement. Um, so I think you're okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't sweat it. James Giles with the love on the office. Thank you. Yeah. Casey, that's a good one. Um, it, you know, <laughs> honestly, Casey, it, I, I wouldn't put it past uh, re-imaging the machine, okay? 
because you can't be unless you had good logs you can't be sure what that threat actor did second of all it might help educate the end user to not do stuff like that in the future all right looking at chat um friendship house uh not sure what you're asking for uh ggg neil says do you have any law enforcement references just received my cyber cert and i'm looking to go to the private sector when you say law enforcement references i don't know what you mean ggg neil what i would say is for law enforcement you may want to look at digital forensics or uh cyber threat intelligence those both pair nicely automatically with um law enforcement backgrounds also hey this is very uh germane right now uh hold on one second Um, next on, on Thursday, November 9th, uh, GGG Neil and really all of you, but, um, I'm having, oh my God, I'm having bro, I'm having Jessica Hyde, the real Jessica Hyde, not the utopia, John Cusack, Jessica Hyde. This woman right here is Jessica Hyde. She is a incredibly seasoned, uh, incident, um, excuse me. She's an incredibly seasoned digital forensics investigator. She takes on some of the hardest cases when real, you know, you know, Fortune 50 companies, US government need something solved, they call Jessica. Jessica's going to be my guest on Simply Cyber Live uh on um November 9th. And we're we're going to be starting with the question, is digital forensics entry level? Yes or no? Right. Let's have a long, let's have a discussion about that. Is digital forensics actually entry level? She can answer that. Also shout out. She's a, she's a former Marine. Oorah. I'm not a Marine. I come from a Marine Corps family. I did support the Marine Corps uh, through private sector services at HQMC in Quantico. Woo -woo. But anyways, Jessica Hyde, you definitely don't want to miss this episode. She's awesome. Awesome. Such a great person. Okay. Let's keep rolling. Uh, 235. Oh, we lost a lot of people um, to jaw jacking. Um, let's uh, NSA virus lab is building a lab also. Uh, I mean, building a, a shed. Oh, thanks, NSA virus lab. I did not. I, I documented it uh, like still frames and stuff throughout the process. I can make a video, but it's going to it's going to take some time um, to make it. Adam V says it's, it showed SQL tables and path of the machine. Ooh, yeah, that's not good. Um, I mean, you did the best you could. You, you disclosed it, you know? All right, little Bobby tables. That's right, Guy Thompson. Uh, I have not taken Matacor's course. Uh, queued up if you have any thoughts on that, that'd be cool. Uh, Raging Greg 13 with the super chat. Best yep. All right. Hey, uh, what are the points used for uh, Raging Greg? I don't know what points you're referring to, so you'll have to uh, help me understand that question a little bit more. But uh, definitely ready to answer it when, when I get the understanding. Uh, hey, have a good one, Justin Gold. Entry level, absolutely night. Guy Thompson uh, weighing in. Billy DP just got laid off. That sucks. More time to devote to a cyber career. Uh, Marcus Kyler's entry level and differ. There we go. Hey, Marcus, I would love for you to attend uh, the Nicole, um, excuse me, the Jessica Hyde talk. Give your thoughts on that. It'd be really cool. Uh, let's see. Yep, Marcus Kyler saying Josh Matacor's material is super legit. I 100% agree with that. I love Josh. I'd like to get Josh on the show. It's just I've been, honestly, I've been super busy. Um... We're going to have Mike Saunders from Red Sea, John. We're going to have um, Mike Prevett um, from Return on Investment uh, Security, who's really a cool dude. Basically, I, I bring cool people on. Oh, we're going to have Gary Binder on November 30th, the guy from Intel who was on a little while ago, except it's not going to be with Intel. It's just going to be Gary. And dude, he's going to go so deep down the rabbit hole on quantum computing 
brings him Advil. Okay, he's put together like a, like a fifty slide PowerPoint deck. Bring some Advil. I mean, here, like, if you want to know anything about quantum computing, you're going to find out. Gary's going to drop knowledge bombs, but bro, it's like, wow. Uh, runaway Amish female saying, will I eventually be able to just know the acronyms being thrown around? Yeah, well, so runaway Amish female, what acronyms would you like to know? Because I, I definitely, I'm big on inclusion and... Um, you know, not having like inside jokes. And if we do bringing you into the fold, like Carl. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of acronyms and uh, that's why coming to the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Briefing is valuable because uh, we use them and break them down and do all those things. Uh, you know, it's really funny. I don't know if audit, uh, audit on, on, on T uh, is pointing here. Uh, you know what's funny, Runaway Amish, is that you'll you'll learn the acronyms and then you'll forget what they actually stand for. You'll just remember the acronyms, right? So, like, I'm trying to think of like what's a uh, an acronym that I I sometimes I forget. Um, I don't know, like OSI. <laughs> like, is that open source? No, no, no. What is it? Operating what? So when we talk about the OSI stack, the network stack. I forget what OSI stands for. Like that's a perfect example. Like everybody just calls it OSI. I don't... Open systems interconnections. Who knew that? Like, and be be honest, right? Like, were you like, oh yeah, no, Jerry, that's the open system interconnection. Everybody just calls it OSI. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, thanks for the super chat. Um, Raging Greg. Can we just become best friends? Yep. All right. So half a CPE every day, two and a half a week, 10 a month. Um, so raging Greg's asking about the CPEs. Here's the deal guys. Uh, CPE is an acronym for continuing professional education. Yeah. Yara is another good one. Uh, so CPEs, when you get a cybersecurity certification, whether it's sec plus CISP, CISA, system PN, well, PNPT is not that way, but Anyways, many cybersecurity certifications require you to do two things to maintain them. One, pay an annual fee. And then two, um, get CPEs, right? Because here's the deal. These organizations, they want to get paid, but they also don't want someone to have a CISP who got the CISP in 2009 and then went and became a chef for 15 years and then came back and is walking around talking about, Oh, I got a CISP, but they haven't continued to stay abreast of the field. So the way that they manage that is by requiring you to get CPEs continuing professional education, which is either through going to classes, going to uh, conferences, going to webinars, which is basically what the daily threat briefing is. So you need most organizations require you to get like 40 a year, or 120 every three years. So like you could do 60 the first year and then do uh, 20 the second year and then 40 the last year, whatever. So CPEs can be a major pain in the butt, okay? Especially if you're like coming up on renewal and it's like you need to get your CPEs by like next week and then you're like, oh my God. Like you end up taking like classes you don't want or lectures you don't care about and it sucks. The daily cyber threat briefing is only a half a CPE. Usually it's one hour per CPE. Just to be conservative, I say half a CPE, even though the show is an hour long. And by doing that, you did 10 a month, right? If you did it over a year, you get 120 in a year. 120 a year is how many you need for three years. So it's more than enough CPEs. So Raging Greg, I hope that um, makes sense. <laughs> Sis P, that's funny. All right. What else? Oh my God. Someone tried to sell you CPEs? That's gross. All right. C Tim. Oh, come on, Johnny Five. That's still relatively new. Continuous threat exposure management. I just did a course on it if you're interested. Also, also, just so people know, um, I've got some news to share with you guys. Um, 
Besides Charleston, November 4th. November 4th, Besides Charleston, downtown Charleston, South Carolina. I will be keynoting. Whoop, whoop. I'll be keynoting in... Uh, and uh, if you're interested, you can come check it out. Also, uh, hey, name can, what is this? Uh, really quickly, uh, want to say shout out. Thanks for the super chat. Can we just become best friends? Yep. And uh, saying what's fun is when you have to start remembering acronyms that can mean different things contextually. Exactly. So true. Um, guys, if you want to catch this keynote, uh, definitely come check it out. I'll be there live. I think it is live streaming online if you want to check it out. Also, also, um, I was asked, I'm trying to take December off. Okay. I was asked by Black Hills Information Security if I would do a webinar in December. And I said, yes, because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a glutton for punishment. But I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to deliver this talk for the um, Black Hills anti-cast in December. So technically, if you miss this talk, You'll be able to catch it again in a different, slightly different version uh, in December. So that's okay. Parking downtown Charleston's not bad at all, Frank. There's lots of parking garages. Charleston's very walkable. Where I'll be speaking is like dead center downtown by Francis Marion Square, right on the College of Charleston campus. Great food. Um, you know, it'll be a good time. You guys are in for a treat if you're coming down to the low country. Ion Q. Good grief, man. There's so much fraud and just like scamminess in cybersecurity. It sucks. <sighs> All right. Um, yeah, I love uh I love uh the low country too. All right. So any questions about like anything? Definitely here to uh answer questions. Let's see. Finishing my deck. I want it like studios coming together. I'm excited. I'm having some struggles here with uh, with my live video studio uh, podcast setup. Basically, um, I have an A10 mini and I'm trying to run cameras through it, but I'm not getting clean HDMI. Hashtag content creator first world problems, right? Yeah, Adam, you'll be fine. Absolutely. What's up, Danny B? Jerry guy. Yep. That's my, uh, that's my handle for video games and stuff. Nick Barker. Good to see you, Nick. Love it. Staying in North Charleston when I'm in town. I hope the commute won't be far. Uh, Frank, it will not be too far, but I mean, it's still going to be like, I mean, depending where you're staying in North Charleston, it could be like a 10 or 15 minute drive. Uh, just so you know, thanks Leon Elliott. Thanks, Leon Elliott. Um, yeah, I'm super pumped about the whole the whole studio. Loving, I'm loving what's going on. I'm super excited. Uh, still, still trying to get the lighting right. Right now, right now for the studio, I'm more focused on this setup and this shot. There's going to be a camera right here, looking in that direction, and it's going to be like a live video uh, podcast setup. GGG Neil, Can we just become best friends. Yep. Thank you for the super chat. Friendship House says, what kind of job title should I be looking for for GRC auditing? Uh, easy. GRC analyst, IT auditor, uh, FISMA auditor, SOC auditor, um, IT auditor, FedRAMP auditor. Here, let's do this as an exercise. Have a great day, Alana. Got a couple more minutes. Uh, here, let's do this as an exercise for uh, Friendship House, okay? Uh, I'm going to go to LinkedIn. Right. And let's look for jobs. Uh, GRC analyst auditor. All right. So check it out. Look at jobs. Let's see. And let's put, I don't know what your experience level is, but we'll just say entry level and associate. Uh, Nick Barker. Uh, the studio is a long time coming. How many videos have you done total before you built the studio? 
Um, I'd say a thousand videos. The YouTube channel has over a thousand videos on it, which is unbelievable. All right, so right here you could see here's GRC. Uh, we don't want that. So internal auditor, auditor, uh, technical technology risk advisor. There's probably some audit in there. Yeah, you definitely want the word IT. You could say FISMA auditor. Let me try that one. My first uh, GRC gig was FISMA audit. Uh, let's see. Security control assessor. That's another keyword, security control assessor um, to look for friendship house. I know, Nick. I, I actually got uh, communicate, not communicated, but like I got a, a notification of my thousandth upload. I was like, Jesus. Channels coming together. What, what, what do we got here? We've got, I want to say uh, 85,000 people. Ah, uh, Chuck of the thousand video challenge. That that'd be great. Uh, currently at eighty one thousand six hundred. Yeah, you could see, you could see right here. Whoops. Yeah, right there. Oh, hold on one second. Let me, let me do this. All right, look at this really quick. Right, thousand videos, eighty-one thousand subs. So if you're not, <laughs> if it, guys, believe me, there's a video for everything. I try, I try like heck to have a video for most things. Um, that most questions that you have. Runaway Amish female, female FISMA is the Federal Information Security Management Act. It's a U.S. federal law that requires federal IT systems to comply with minimum security requirements. And they're required to be audited, which is why there's a ton of jobs out there because um, the U.S. government hires third parties like Booz Allen, Deloitte, SAIC, SRC, Northrop Grumman, small businesses, et cetera, to do the auditing. Uh, so you can find all sorts of work on that. Can I yeet you out for some old time's sake? Heck yeah. Watch this. <laughs> there you go, Adam. Adam loves himself some audit. I mean, uh, yeah, some audit, <laughs> Jesus, some yeeting. Uh, Wax says, how do I show projects like home labs on a resume? How do you recommend to get volunteer experience? Well, volunteer experience, volunteer, um, find ways to deliver value. And then for showing any projects on home labs, what I like to do is treat like your home lab, almost like it's a job, right? So have like your role, with the you know, the bold title, the date you did it, just like a job, and then list your home lab stuff like, not that you made a home lab, but like, what did you learn? What impactful transformations did you have? Can you review SIM logs? Did you set up uh, an EDR and tune it? Like, what did you do in the home lab? Put those as your bullets and it'll look like a job post and uh, people will read it that way. And it'll be, you know, genuine because you're not, you're not faking it. All right. Uh, really quick with Twitch starting to allow multi-streaming, do you might start streaming there live too? Um, thanks for the super chat. Um, you know, that's a good question. I don't know. Maybe, maybe Twitch. I did a little bit on Twitch, but uh, you know, it, it, the, all the cool stuff that Twitch offers doesn't really integrate with like the way YouTube does it. And I, I've kind of built on YouTube. So, um, all right. So I'm going to get going guys. Um, yeah, you could make a nonprofit yourself. Nick Barker thinking outside the box. Guys, thank you all so very much. I got a 9.30 a.m. meeting I got to run to. But you guys have been great. I hope you enjoyed the jaw jacking. Thank you all so very much to the 200 of you who hung out. Thanks again to Eric Taylor for the 100 squad memberships. Uh, if you were one of the ones who picked that up, very cool. And if not, maybe next time. I'll be back tomorrow at 8 a.m. Eastern time for the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Briefing Podcast. Ooh. Uh, really quick, just as a last minute thing, BSEC is saying users, uh, people can create their own home lab on um, Microsoft 365 for free. So definitely check that out. Could be a fun video. Um, could be a fun video to, to make. Yeah, I saw that uh, Eric Capuano released it. Thanks, Tony Parrish. All right, guys, I'm Jerry, your chat. Until next time, stay secure. 
Stay secure. Come on, video. Everybody, I hope you enjoyed that content. Keep the cybersecurity train going by connecting with the other Simply Cyber community resources. We have the Discord server that's lively and always keeps the conversation going. You can connect with me directly on LinkedIn. And also every single weekday morning on the Simply Cyber channel, we're doing live daily cyber threat briefings, 8 a.m. Eastern time, as well as Thursday at 4.30 p.m. We're doing live stream interviews with industry experts, and we produce videos that we push out every Wednesday morning. I'm Jerry from Simply Cyber. I hope you enjoyed the content, and we'll see you in the next one. One.